Good evening. It is such an honor to be here. Heard so many rumors about Findhorn. And to be here and feel the energy in this room, on this land, in you, is truly lovely. It's exquisite. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you've been doing. For the benefit of all beings, we work. We deepen our insight. We deepen our practice. We deepen our ability to love each other and ourselves. That's what it's really all about, isn't it? It's about love. It's about unconditional love. The love that is selfless. The love that would run into a burning building with no thought of your own well-being to save a child or a dog. I don't know about you, But I've had to really work on me, on my conditioning. <laughs> Any of you been conditioned? <laughs> we must cut away that conditioning that is so deep. All those beliefs that we cling to. All those thoughts that we're so attached to, my precious thoughts, <laughs> my precious feelings. Do you have any precious feelings? <laughs> when I'm like this, I can't love unconditionally. There's something in the way. Do you know what it is? It's me. <laughs> and if I can just let go of me and just be, just be here, present, presence itself, there's love until I come back. <laughs> This is really so simple, isn't it? Every child understands this. Every child knows when they receiving unconditional love and when they're not. <laughs> we all know. But it is so difficult, isn't it? Especially if this happens back here where I can't see it. So in this modern and postmodern age, all the religious traditions must be updated. There's a lot that's happened in the last thousand years, yes? <laughs> the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Age, the development of science and psychology. There's so much that has happened. The emergence of integral theory. From my perspective, we finally have a theory that includes every aspect of human nature and leaves nothing out. We have never had this before. Perhaps we should include this too. <laughs> So, I'd like to say a little bit about Buddhism. Because Zen is the mystical branch of Buddhism. Just like Kabbalah is the mystical branch of Judaism. And Sufism is the mystical branch of, of Islam. And the Gnostics 
were the mystical branch of Christianity. Zen is the mystical branch of Buddhism. There's so many seekers in the world. Are there any seekers in this room? <laughs> seekers are always seeking something. I spent 50 years seeking, seeking, endlessly seeking. I looked everywhere. But the mystics all know what it is to be a finder instead of a seeker. No matter what branch of mysticism they follow, they find something. They find the same thing. Do you know what they find? Silence. Nothing. <laughs> And that's all I'm bringing tonight, is nothing. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you were expecting something. <laughs> all I have is nothing. And it's the most valuable thing I could bring. This silence is the only water that will quench our deepest thirst. And from here, we can truly listen. 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 So a little bit about Buddhism, Buddhism 101. When the Buddha woke up, he said, Atta Deepa which literally translates as the light, the light. We take a little liberty and we translate this as you are this light. <sighs> and then he noticed three things about everything that exists. The first thing he noticed is impermanence. Nothing lasts forever. Everything else passes away. <laughs> Everything that comes into being will cease to be. There's impermanence. The second mark of existence, all things that exist, is suffering. The Sanskrit word is dukkha, suffering. The image is that of a cart that's being pulled by an ox. The axle of the cart freezes so the wheels can't turn. So the, the wheels are being drug along the cobblestones, dragging the wheel. Does that ever feel like your life, dragging the wheel? <laughs> it does mine at times, dragging the wheel not freely turning, suffering. The third thing, the third mark of existence is selflessness. There is no permanent self. These three things became known as the three marks of existence. Out of the second mark of existence, the suffering, arose the Four Noble Truths. The first Noble Truth is there's suffering in the world. Have you noticed that? There's suffering in the world. It's not so evident here. But go to a third wheel country, join the Peace Corps, and it becomes much more obvious. Suffering. The second noble truth is there's a cause to the suffering. And the third noble truth is if there's a cause to the suffering, there must be a way to end suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the way to end suffering is follow the Eightfold Path. The first step on the Eightfold Path 
is right view. Right view. You must have a right view. And a right view is one that does not block insight. Do you want to see a, a wrong view? So you know what a right view is? You ready? That's a wrong view. Can you feel it? Do you want to see a right view? Do you want to see it again? <laughs> so we must begin with a right view, one that does not block our insight. If I believe anything too tightly, it becomes a wrong view. Better to not know. Don't know mind is the way. It's a right view. But it's not enough just to have a right view. We must have right thought, the second step on the Eightfold Path. We must make our thinking congruent with our right view. And that's not enough. We must take the third step. We must make our speech, what comes out of our mouth, congruent with our right thinking and our right view. But that's not enough. We must make our action congruent, right action congruent with right speech and right thought and right view. And that's not even enough. We must take the fifth step. We must have a right livelihood. One that does not create any more suffering in this world. That's rather difficult in this crazy culture. Yes? This is right livelihood. I just go around talking about nothing. It just doesn't pay very well. <laughs> but the riches are wonderful. I finally found what I'm born to do. I'm never going to retire. And I haven't starved to death yet. <laughs> but that's not even enough. Right livelihood, right action. Right speech, right thought, right view. Now we're finally ready to start meditating. Right meditation, right concentration. This is mindfulness training. It's shamatha. It's preparing the garden to plant. It's getting the mind ready to meditate. One way is to focus on the breath. The breath is always here. I can't breathe yesterday. I can't breathe tomorrow. I can only breathe now. So this anchors awareness in the present moment. Now. Be here now, as Ram Dass said. <laughs> Be here now. Find the breath and focus the awareness on the breath and the body. Be here now. This prepares the garden for planting, the seeds of meditation. Once I've stabilized my ability to stay present in this moment, then I begin to notice what's arising in my mind. Oh, that was a thought. Let it go. Oh, that was a feeling. Ah, let it go. That was a self-referencing moment. Anybody ever self-reference? <laughs> How am I doing, huh? <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> self-referencing. Comparing yourself to others yourself to an agenda you have or someone else has. So notice it and let it go and come back to the breath. Noticing all the content, 
Oh, the stories and the images and the spirituality, the meaning. Just notice and let them go and come back to the breath and the body in the moment. And after considerable practice with Vipassana, noticing the content of mind and letting it go, now we notice that there's just a tiny bit of space between the thoughts and the feelings. And we notice that in that tiny space of emptiness, insights begin to arise. And the quality of the insight is different than the quality of the thoughts and the feelings. It's deeper. It arises out of the silence between the thoughts. So we begin to expand the silence and increase the frequency of insights. Now we're beginning to meditate. It's the insights, the clarity of insight. Now we're beginning to practice Zen. Do you know what Zen is? It's a Japanese word. It's how the Japanese say the Chinese word Chan, which was shortened from Chana. Chan is how the Chinese said the Sanskrit, the Indian word, dhyana. Dhyana means pure awareness, uncontaminated by thoughts, feelings, stories, sensing, self-referencing. Pure, selfless awareness. This is Zen. This is meditative mind. This is what we're working on when we meditate. And there are two forms of meditation that have come to the West from Japan. The first form is Soto Zen. It was the Zen of the farmers in feudal Japan. Farmers are very patient. You know, they tend the crops. They wait for them to grow. They love them. The other school of Zen is samurai Zen. It was the Zen of the feudal lords. They're not so patient. <laughs> Guess which one I am. <laughs> so I look at the other school and I say, that's lazy Zen. They just sit. They don't do anything. The instructions are just sit. And in 20 years, you realize who you really are. Lazy Zen. I'm Renzai Zen. We say, of course, you're already awake. You're already Buddhas. But wake up now! <laughs> It only takes about 20 years, traditionally, traditionally. So in Soto Zen, the meditation instructions in Japan are very simple. They say, just sit, but just sit, <coughs> just sit. In Renzai Zen, we use koans to meditate on. We use koans. There's 1,700 koans. This is a path of sudden awakening. You never know when it's going to happen. You might have to sit for a few years. <laughs> In 
in the school of Zen that is hollow bone Zen, which is a Western version of Renzai Zen that my teacher founded, we start with the listen koan. Is it possible to just purely listen? So this becomes our meditation. We find the breath and we silently with the in-breath repeat the word listen. And then we listen as deeply as we can. And with the out-breath, we silently repeat the word listen. And then we listen as deeply as we can. Listen. 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 And after a while, we suggest that you, you move into the listening inside the listening, 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 become the listening, listening, listening. And after considerable practice, then comes the koan, who is listening? <laughs> Who is listening? We're looking for that insight, suddenly to see who is listening. So, 1,700 koans in the Chinese-Japanese koan training. Most of them don't make any sense to a Westerner. They're from a culture that is so foreign. A typical koan is what is the sound of one hand. Someone added the one hand clapping. <laughs> what is the sound of one hand? What is your true face before your, your parents were born? <clears throat> I received my first koan when I was four or five years old without knowing it. I heard the word infinity. And I was a thinker. You know, some people count sheep. I used to think of myself to sleep. And suddenly this word infinity did not compute. I couldn't get my little head around infinity. What is infinity? What is infinite? Never ending, never beginning. It was not in my experience. So thinking, 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 until suddenly my thinking tied itself into a knot and thinking stopped, and suddenly I fell into infinity. Have you ever been walking in the morning at dawn and just been struck dumb by the beauty of a sunrise? It takes your breath away, yes? <laughs> It's not the breath that's taken away. It's the thinking and feeling. Suddenly you drop to your knees and just appreciate the beauty that surrounds you. This is like a koan. Thinking stops, self-referencing stops. The self falls away, and there is just pure, selfless presence taking in the beauty of a sunset or a sunrise. 
Yes. Working in the garden. <laughs> it happens so many different ways, so naturally. This is the deepest truth of who we are. So, my teacher, his teacher was Japanese. They had a problem that they kept bumping into. Edo Shimano was raised in Japan. He was of the view that there was no Zen outside of Japanese culture. And I suspect that was true for him. My teacher, Jimpo Kondo Dennis Kelly, was not Japanese, he was American. And every time Edo would say there is no Zen outside of Japanese culture, Jumpo would go, oh, don't say that. I'm not Japanese. There must be. So they had this one thing that they could not agree on. And eventually Jumpo left. And he left to establish a form of Zen outside of Japanese culture. <laughs> he had a lot of work to do. Edo had already translated the sutra book, the sutras that we use in our, our chanting, into broken English from Japanese. So all Jumpo had to do was translate it into flowing English. But the koans were a little more difficult. What he did with the koans, he and Edo had taken those 1,700 koans and reduced them to 108, which is a significant number in, in Buddhism. 108 koans that would make more sense to Westerners. And Jumpo decided to reduce that to 16 koans. The first one, is, is it possible to just listen? Some people say yes. Some people say no. Some people have to be led. So in traditional Japanese koan training, or Chinese koan training, the koan is presented. You have one shot to answer it. And you're almost always wrong. So the bell is rung and you go back to the zendo and you meditate some more. <laughs> and you try it the next day. You present your answer, the bell is rung, you go back to the zendo. There's never any clues. <laughs> it may be 20 years on the same koan. You may never get it. You may die without ever answering the koan. It's okay. Or you may, you may answer that one and then get another one. 1,700 koans, there's only one answer. <laughs> but you must speak from this presence to answer the koan. It doesn't matter what you answer. What really matters is who is answering the koan. Is the person answering it eh, wrong? Or is presence itself answering the koan spontaneously? So that didn't work very well with Westerners. Anybody willing to sit with the same question for 20 years? Anybody not willing to do that? So what Jumpo decided to do, he decided to lead the Westerners, like me and you, most of you, with language. Lead you with language into a, a taste of the answer of the koan. 
Is it possible to purely listen? So can you listen without an opinion? Can you listen with an opinion? <laughs> Is that pure listening? Can you think and listen at the same time? I can't. But I used to think I could. I used to think I could multitask. Now I know that I can only truly do one thing at a time, which has been supported by neuroscience. When we multitask, we split our attention and the efficiency drops dramatically with just two tasks, three tasks. That's why we can't text and drive. <laughs> so, Ken Wilber says something that's very relevant here. He said, states of mind are mutually exclusive. It is not possible to be drunk and sober at the same time. And if you think it is, you know, the, the police might disagree with you <laughs> if you get stopped. So I would say it's not possible to be drunk with thoughts or feelings, and sober with pure listening at the same time. Is it? Yeah. So is it possible to just purely listen? And then the second question, where is the locus, the center of this deep listening in your body? Everybody, just listen as deeply as you can. Completely listening. And scan your body. Where do you feel this deep listening? Put your hand on the, the center, the locus of the deep listening in your body. Put your hand on it, and we're going to look around and see where it is. So look around and see where people feel this, the felt sense of deep listening, the center, the locus. This has been a fascinating exercise for me. I've asked thousands of people this question in settings like this. And what I've noticed is, of course, most people that come listen to me talk about nothing are seekers. They're seeking something. I've noticed with this demographic, 90% of the hands go to the heart. Four or five percent go to the throat. And four or five percent go to the hara, the gut. One out of a hundred goes here, and there are all sorts of different combinations with that other 1%. <laughs> I noticed a few right here. Yeah. It's interesting. 90% say there's a heartfelt quality to listening. And that seems to be about the, what's happening here. Isn't that interesting? I'm an old judo guy, so for me it's hara. Everything's in the hara. The bindu point, the center. If you don't have your awareness in the hara, you end up flying through the air. <laughs> but I can move this heartfelt listening into the heart. Can you, if you felt it somewhere else, can you move it into the heart? When I do that, it has a, a heartfelt quality to it. It's a little different. 
And of course, the whole spinal column is alive with listening. The chakras are all listening centers. In fact, every atom in the universe is listening for the perfect atom to make a molecule. Every cell is listening for what to let in and what to keep out. The whole universe is alive with listening. So we're deepening this listening. We're deepening our ability to listen deeper and deeper until we can listen from silence. I was just taken on a walk through the original garden and I could feel something very special about this land. I don't know what it is, but I really feel it. Sandy ground that doesn't grow anything and listening listening for what will it take for life to grow in this sandy soil. That deep listening to the plants. What do you need? What is missing here? What can I do? Listening from love. And look what's grown here. Isn't that amazing? It is to me, walking through this ground. A beautiful flower has grown near, and you are the petals. Wow, this is truly the power of listening. Yes, yes. Surely this must be one of the principles of this community. Deep, deep listening. And I suspect you might have trouble listening to each other occasionally. <laughs> Is that not true? <laughs> so practice deepening the listening to include listening to each other. Wouldn't that be a wonderful practice? Yes. So we have the first 11 koans in this process we call Mondo Zen. This is a manual. We give it away. You can download it on the internet. It's a 50 page manual that is the life work of my teacher. It's incredible. This is the most profound transformative practice I have ever experienced. This is what we're going to do tomorrow in the workshop for however many come. This is, we just spent seven days on retreat working through this process. Incredible what happens. Seven days of listening deepening our listening, moving, cutting away what gets in the way of our listening. <laughs> the first 11 koans in this book are systematically cutting away everything that is not the deepest truth of who we are. Is it possible to just listen? Where is the center of this deep listening in the body? And from this deep listening, this heartfelt listening, who are you? The third koan. So stop for a moment and answer that in your mind. Who are you really? And if you were sitting in front of me, looking in my eyes, you'd be on the hot seat. 
with no place to hide. <laughs> and you'd have to give me an answer. Most people will tell me what they think. And then I simply say, Ah, I've asked you who you are at your deepest level. And you tell me what you think. I hold up the mirror so they can see. Oh, you're telling me what you think. Can you go deeper than thought? And then often they tell me what they feel. <laughs> and I hold up the mirror again. So first you tell me what you think. And now you tell me what you feel. Can you go deeper than thought and feeling? And then they often tell me what they sense. Some will get really clever as I'm ringing the bell. And they'll say, I'm the sound of the bell. <laughs> and then I'll say something like, very clever. Can you go deeper than your cleverness? So everything they present, I cut away. Not that, not that, not that, not that. Who are you, really? And finally, when they're exhausted, they've exhausted all their clever ideas. They'll tell me the truth. They'll say, I don't know. <laughs> And then there's such a relief. How many of you were taught you had to know who you are? <laughs> oh, you mean I don't have to know who I am? <sighs> what a relief. <laughs> and then we shift to a slightly deeper truth. We move from the I don't know, we drop the I, and we move into don't know mind. Don't know. Beginner's mind. Don't know. What does it take to grow, to grow a garden in the sandy soil? Don't know. Listen. Listen, what does it take? Listen, don't know, listen. Ah, let's try this. Ah, until the insights begin to arise out of nowhere. And suddenly an answer appears. We see the one right thing to do under these circumstances. And we try it. No doubt, it works. And we continue until we run into another problem where we don't know. And we have to ask and listen. So if we get rid of the I, we get rid of the problem, the me. So Junpo answers this question. Who are you at your deepest level? With two words not knowing, not knowing. So next we play a game. So I'm going to ask you who you are. Everybody hold up your dominant hand, the one you write with. So I'm going to ask you with my thinking mind, who are you? Answer with your thinking mind and your body. I don't know. I gotta know, I need to know. You ready? So, who are you? I don't know. Feel the contraction of I don't know. Let I show up. I don't know. I don't know. And then drop into your heart, into a deeper truth of who you are. And the same question. But the answer here is not knowing. Really move into the not knowing. Who are you, 
really not knowing. Who are you? I don't know. Who are you? Yeah. So tomorrow in the workshop that we do, there will be no hiding. <laughs> you have to be active. <laughs> it is such a relief, this not knowing. This is what ego is. It's a contraction. It's one contraction after another. This is not knowing. Listening to this instead of this. And your problems will disappear. <laughs> not so funny, huh? <laughs> It's so simple. It's just difficult. It's difficult to give up this, to see it and release it. So there are three poisons in Buddhism, often known as greed, anger, and ignorance. But it's so easy to say, I'm not angry. I'm not ignorant. I'm not greedy, but it's really much more human than that. It's really ignorance of the deepest truth of who we are, the not knowing beyond thoughts, feelings, and sensing. Ignorance of this, believing we're this, rather than realizing who we really are. That's basic ignorance. The second poison is attachment. Attachment. And the third poison, aversion, pushing away. clinging and pushing away, liking and disliking. They are so human, so fundamentally human. We learn to like and dislike very young, but then we get a little too attached to what we like and a little too pushing away of what we don't like. And that creates suffering. It is so simple, so simple to let go of our attachments, what we cling to, and to accept what we push away, to just be present with no opinions, no likes, no dislikes, no attachments. You can have likes and dislikes. It's when we attach to them and cling to them that the problem starts. Or when we start pushing them away so hard, we start fighting with each other. That's when the suffering starts. So what we're doing in this Mondo Zen process is 20 years of koan training in one day. <laughs> now, of course, you're not going to have the same insight in one day that you have 20 years of struggling and meditating and struggling. But you'll get a taste of it. You'll get a taste of it. It is a powerfully transformative process. So this is the process of waking up. 
letting go of our attachments to things. Trungpa Rinpoche, a Tibetan master who founded Naropa University in Colorado where I live, he would draw a picture of a bird, an outline of a bird on a whiteboard behind him. And then he would ask students, what do you see? And the hands would go up, I see a bird. Interesting. And then he'd say, what else do you see? And someone might say, I see flight, flight. And someone else might say, I see freedom. And when all the answers were exhausted, they were some form of those three answers. He would say, do you, see, do you know what I see? And they would say, no, what do you see? And he'd say, I see the empty sky. The vast, empty sky. Nothing but empty sky. So the gross physical stuff, the physical body of the Buddha, the name of this in Buddhism is the Nirmanakaya, the gross physical body of the Buddha. That's like the, the form of the bird. And then the Sambhokakaya is the subtle, energetic body of the Buddha. Yum, subtle energy. Meaning, feelings. Yum. The empty sky is the Dharmakaya. The subtle body of the Buddha is the Sambhokakaya, the bliss body of the Buddha. The Dharmakaya, the empty sky, is the truth body of the Buddha in Mahayana Buddhism. So that's what he was bringing forth. He was bringing forth states of mind, attachments. When we outgrow our attachments to gross physical form, we move on to the bliss body, to subtle forms. And then we get attached to those and we push away the gross physical things. And then that too runs its course. And suddenly we're seeking again, seeking. And that's when we start to move into the empty sky, into the silence, into the Dharmakaya. And here we get attached to emptiness. We call it Zen disease or the stink of Zen. Somebody that's grasping emptiness so desperately. All of those graspings, physical things, subtle energetic things, or nothing. Every time we cling too tightly or we push away too hard, we're causing ourselves and everyone around us to suffer. To suffer. And we don't see it until our insight is deep enough. So when we let go of the attachment to emptiness, there's a poem that I just love that describes us so beautifully. You know, these things you can only, the closest you can get is poetry. It's written by a 16th century German Christian poet by the name of Angelus Cilicius. He says, God, whose presence is everywhere, can't come to visit you until you aren't here. <laughs> so
So in this Mando Zen process, we're using an old Hindu trick called nete, nete, nete. Not that. Who are you? I'm not that. I'm not that. I'm not that. Until finally you run out of answers and you admit the truth that you don't know. How could you? How could you know this great mystery of who we are? <laughs> and then you can move. There's room to move into the not knowing and listen. Listen to nature. Who's been the greatest teacher for 10,000 years? Nature. Alone with nature and the mountains, in the forest, in the desert, the greatest teacher. Listening to yourself, listening to the intelligence, listening to the silence. So once we're completely empty, no me. God comes. In Buddhism, it's the unity of absolute clarity and selfless compassion, unconditional love. So this unconditional love and this clarity, this is non-duality. This is becoming one with God. And this, as a Indian Jesuit priest said by the name of Anthony DeMello. He died in the middle eighties in a plane crash. He was born on the streets of Calcutta, became a Jesuit priest. And to me, he's a Zen master. He's awake. He was awake. He said, as human beings, our deepest longing, is for unity with God. And how do you attain unity with God, you ask? And his answer was silence. And how do you, how do you, what is silence? His answer was meditation. And what is meditation? His answer was silence. Silence. So I always ask when I'm working with people, I ask, what is sacred to you? And then I listen. I just listen. And people tell me. They tell me what they're attached to, what they're clinging to, and what they're pushing away. They tell me what's poisoning their life. And then I know how to help them. I know what medicine they need. <laughs> if what is sacred to them is success or what kind of car they drive, oh my. I say, go try to meditate. Come back later <laughs> after you've suffered some more. <laughs> But if what is sacred to them is something of the Sambhokakaya, the energy body of the Buddha, feelings, sacredness, meaning, I say, wonderful, come on in. Come on in. Try silence. See how that tastes. See if it doesn't enrich what's sacred to you. Because it will. It will deepen what's sacred. It will deepen the sacredness until you can let it go. And then you'll start clinging to the silence. <laughs> and then we keep meditating until you can let that go too. 
And with my clinging, I'm letting go of my attachment to me, my addiction to me. And when I'm not here, then God comes. <laughs> so that's how I help people. I listen to them. And then I work with them to let go of their attachments and let go of their allergies until they can live here. But then that's waking up. That's not enough. Guess what we have to do now? <laughs> we have to worry about growing up, evolving. Anybody remember growing up? Anybody remember learning to walk? Do you have any kids? Have you watched them walk? Any nephews or nieces? <laughs> Brothers or sisters? How do you learn to walk? Well, you stumble and fall. May you fall quickly so you can learn to walk. <laughs> we need to create a context of learning, of being willing to fail and struggle and learning quickly how to walk. Safety is a really big thing for a lot of people. Safety. And of course, safety is important. A foundational safety is important. But sometimes we get a little too attached to safety. I love what Stephen Levine said. He was a Buddhist teacher, did a lot of work with death and dying, a lot of work in prisons. He worked on death row when the, the men and women knew exactly when they were going to die. He said he often found them fantasizing. It was close to the time to walk, that last walk. And they would find themselves fantasizing about how they were going to come back and tell their cellmates what it was like to die. It was just inconceivable, this death. So he had said something that really resonated with me. He said, safety is the most unsafe spiritual path you can take. It keeps you frozen in fear, unable to take chances, which means you are unable to learn because you're frozen in fear. May you fail quickly and often so that you can learn and change and adapt. How quickly do things change here? <laughs> How many people are trying to keep things safe? Interesting. The problem's not just here. We have the same problem many places. I've worked with a lot of organizations, especially spiritual organizations that have that problem. Unwilling to take risks, which means you're unwilling to learn. How does the infant learn to walk? Is it concerned about safety? I don't think so. <laughs> Now, are the parents concerned about safety? Yes, that's a good thing. Let the parents be concerned about safety. Let them take away all the cliffs <laughs> and all the things that could hurt the child. That's their job. But the infant, beginner's mind, is not worried about safety. Not till it falls a few times. <laughs> so, After we've gone through all 11 koans and we've tasted the deepest truth of who we are, tasted it for ourselves, 
which we haven't done tonight, by the way. It takes a little longer. And it's a little difficult to work with a crowd this size. But after we have, we say, okay, now, this moment, you're awake. So what? What are you going to do with it? That's the important question. How are you going to bring it back in your life? How are you going to integrate it in your life and share this clarity and compassion with those that you love? And surely you see now that you love everybody, don't you? <laughs> so that's the last five koans. That's where we learn a really important lesson that will transform our lives and the lives of everyone around us. I hear there's a lot of stress in this environment. Is that true? Does it feel like this? Yes? Anybody live here? <laughs> How would it be if you could learn to let this liberate you? Would that be useful here? Maybe a little bit? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> your angst is your liberation. Your angst is your liberation. How could that be? This is what Mondo Zen does. You know, being awake, so what? Bring it into your life where the rubber meets the road, where the street meets the sky, where you go like this. Does anybody have anything that triggers you and makes you angry or shames you? Or makes you disconnect? Freeze? Anybody got any of those? <laughs> Has that ever happened here in this community? Uh, never happens here. <laughs> well, it certainly happens in my community. <laughs> but we have some medicine for it. Some medicine. Could you use some medicine for this? <laughs> so, there was an old Zen master in China, Chan master. His name was Zwigan. And he was the abbot of a thousand monk monastery. The food was really good there. Thousand monks were meditating in the meditation hall. It was deathly still, silent. And he's sitting on the high seat like this. Right? The abbot sits on the high seat. And all of a sudden, he would say, Master! And he would jump up and he would run outside. And he would say, what, what? And they would go back in and he'd sit down, deathly silent, well-trained monks. Nobody moved, not a ripple in the silence other than his. And then a few minutes later, he would say, stay awake. And he'd jump up and he'd run outside. He'd answer himself, he'd say, I will, I will. And he'd come back in and sit down. <laughs> they all thought he was crazy. Was he crazy? What was he doing? He was teaching. He was teaching them. Call to the master and respond. Respond from here. 
If you go to sleep, wonderful. Master, what? What needs to happen now? Stop the contraction. Drop into the silence. Let your heart break open. And look from here what needs to happen instead of this old habit of contracting. There's only one right thing to do under every set of circumstances. You'll never see it from here. It can only be seen from here. So this is your angst is your liberation. Thirty-seven years I've been married. First 25 were hell. It's a little tough. The last years have been heaven. And the difference is, when my wife noticed that I've done this, she says, Doshin! That's my cue to stop this, drop into the silence, and be present. This practice of noticing when I'm contracted and letting it go, dropping into the silence and being completely present, is called an emotional koan. That's what we call it. It's learning to let your angst become your liberation. And it is a practice that in my home changed hell into heaven. And it's so wonderful if you have kids. You, you teach these kids to this trick, and do you think they can see when you're like that? <laughs> they see everything. And if you teach them how to get you to go from here to here, it will change your relationship with your children, with your wife. And in a community like this, it will transform your relationship with each other. And it's a very difficult practice. It really takes some work. So waking up and growing up, continuing to evolve, continuing to take multiple perspectives, learn how to take more perspectives. That's evolving. That's changing. Take risks. Learning to walk again and again and again, stumbling and falling. But that's not enough. You must also clean up. You must do your shadow work. Those are the contractions that are happening where you can't see them. But everybody else can. I'm an integral Zen master. The difference is, in my Sangha, I have to do shadow work. And I listen to the people in my community. When they say, Doshin, you're in shadow. We stop and I take a survey. And if 20 people in the room, if 18 of them think I am in a shadow contraction, we stop and we process it right there because I am awake until this happens. <laughs> and then this isn't awake. This is me. Back to this. Ah, much better now. Thank you. Now, what did you say? What did you want me to do? <laughs> Instead of, no! What did you want me to consider? It is a new way of working together. It has transformed our whole community. 
And it's taken a few other tools, like a little integral coaching and a little collaborative Zen, but we've been able to work on these tools, learning how to collaborate with each other from here. That'd be a little better than here, wouldn't it? Or here. Yeah. So it's not enough just to wake up. You must evolve, continue to evolve, and you must clean up. You must do some deep shadow work and look at the things that you've cast out of the boundary of self or you think you have. Nothing is lost. As Nietzsche said, be very careful casting out your demons, lest you cast out the most valuable parts of yourself. The things that were so despicable when you were a child or older, that you cast them out and said, I'm not like that. You are still like that. And you need to integrate it back into your personality. And I'll bet you'll find that what you've cast out is the very thing you need to be whole. And if you can do shadow work, before you wake up, it's critical from my perspective. Because after the house of cards falls, all your personas, all the masks you wear, it's very difficult to find the shadows, the parts you've disowned, because the way you find them is going through the window of the persona to find the shadow. So you need to find your shadows before you wake up. And then there's more work to do. There's all the trauma all the trauma of growing up when you were very young and your parents were trying to civilize you so you could survive in this crazy world. And they said, don't do that. What? Oh, again and again, developmental trauma. That has to be cleaned up. And then go deeper. There's the attachment issues, the insecure attachment of an infant with the bond with the mother. Plenty of work to do there. And then that's not enough. What about cleaning up karma? <laughs> All that negative karma that you, you were, you were accumulating when you were so attached to things. Yeah, that has to be cleaned up. Now that you could only do when you're awake. So there's lots of cleaning up to do. You know, it's such a wonderful thing to end in a little silence and appreciation for what brought you here. What brings you here? What keeps you tied to this land and this work you're doing here? And really appreciating the work that's being done for the benefit of all beings right here in this community. I bow at your feet. And let's just rest in silence. Or as Father Keating says, in the grace of God.
deepest gratitude. Thank you for coming. Go in peace.